Welcome to Main Street Living. The Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod invites you to join us in worshiping our Lord. Rev. Keith Bickness brings us today's message, Preparation for Advent. Rev. Bickness will lead us in worship after our opening hymn. Begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us Bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our, the Old Testament lesson for the second Sunday of Advent is from Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 7b. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. 
He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the, so the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widower and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is written in Philippians chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for, for you, all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy, the Holy Gospel today is according to the Gospel of Luke, the third chapter. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iteria and Trochantus, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he, and he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusations, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. 
So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess now our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for my message today is from the book of Malachi, the third chapter. Hear this key verse. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. This is our text. Dear friends in Christ, the police officer rang the doorbell. It was 3 a.m., he had tried to call the family, but all he could get was their answering machine. He knew that his appearance at the, that hour would frighten them, but he needed to talk to them. They answered the door, and before he could explain his presence, he could see the look of horror in their eyes. They were simply not prepared for the awful possibilities that his early morning presence suggested. He tried to expl explain to them as quickly as he could. Your daughter, he began, Oh no, the mother cried out. The officer tried again. Your daughter has been in a serious car accident. Dear God, no, the father moaned. The father jumped in again, or the, the officer jumped in again as quickly as he could. But she's all right. We offered her to take her home, but, but she's pretty shaky and wanted you to come and get her. In the presence of this police officer, who was the designated messenger that night, the parents had experienced the ultimate horror of death and the overwhelming joy of receiving their daughter back from the dead. The relationship between the parents and their daughter changed that night. They cherished one another more deeply. They expressed their love for one another more often. And although from time to time they may have absentmindedly taken one another for granted, it certainly happened less frequently. One night, 
uh, say they, one might say that they lived very differently from that night on. Although through his prophet Malachi, God promised to send a messenger who would bear a twofold message. John the Baptist was the messenger who proclaimed the message of law and gospel, and so was the fulfillment of God's promise. The preaching of John and his baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins prepared people for the coming of the Savior. Today, just as in the days of Malachi and in the days of John the Baptist, we are also receiving God's warning to recognize our own sinfulness and our need to repent. And then by God's grace and mercy, we are called to live as a forgiven people who are prepared for his second coming. To brush off or to ignore his warnings can have devastating consequences. Suddenly, without warning, the Japanese planes were on, their raining, were, were on them, raining down death on the American fleet line anchored at Pearl Harbor. It was Sunday morning, and many of the American servicemen and women were still asleep. Within minutes, battleships were in flames. Over 2,400 American sailors would be dead. Torah, Torah, Torah was the code word that had completely surprised. It really shouldn't have been that way. Even the Japanese themselves did not intend for the attack to come without fair warning. Over the previous several months, Japanese and American diplomats had been negotiating with the goal of avoiding hostilities. But as Japanese resolve turned to war, they hatched this plan. In the days leading up to December 7th, Tokyo sent a series of encrypted messages to its embassy staff in Washington. The messages were to announce that further negotiations would be fruitless, that America had revealed its hostile attitude toward Japan, and that all hope for peace was now lost. The ambassador was to deliver the message to the U.S. Secretary of State shortly before the attack. Unfortunately, the Japanese decoding equipment broke down and the Japanese diplomats themselves did not decode the, the last portion of that message until after the attack was over. Even a last minute attack or warning could have saved some of the lives of those lost at Pearl Harbor. Tomorrow is the anniversary of that attack. President Franklin D. Roosevelt would say the next day that December 7th was a date which will live in infamy. It, if only there had been more of a warning. God's people don't have that excuse. God has been warning his people over and over again about the fiery judgment to come upon those who turn away from him. He has warned, behold, I send my messenger and I will prepare the way before him. And so John the Baptist came warning us to repent so that we might receive humble faith in the Messiah. Christ Jesus, and his glorious promise of salvation rather than eternal flames. Yet, when we are told of our unacceptable behavior, we tend to want to disregard those who point it out. Uh, we become defensive, or we try to overrule whoever is calling us into question. We don't like to hear someone tell us, clean up your act, or you'll lose your privileges, or shape up or ship out. These slogans suggest that our Choices contain consequences. We don't like to be told we're wrong and often resist the, ch the change they are suggesting. Accountability sometimes aggravates us. But such rebellion doesn't make God happy. He could rightly destroy us, and yet his love moves him to cleanse us and to mold us for his service. The problem is that we are often not prepared. We're not ready unless we confess our sin and sinfulness. This sinfulness separates us from God. It was true of our first parents in the garden. Adam blamed God and, and the woman. Eve blamed the serpent, but neither took responsibility for their actions. The result left them outside the garden God had prepared for them and separated them and separated from the God that they had once walked with daily. The same was true for the Jews to whom Malachi was writing. They had broken the covenant they had made with God and chased after other gods, or as Malachi put it, married the, married the daughter of a foreign god. 
Likewise, in the days of John the Baptist, the leaders of God's house were called a, a brood of vipers. In each case, it was a lack of recognition of their own sinfulness that drove God's people away from him. Of course, in our day and age, it's not popular to speak about sinfulness. Many people today say there's no such thing as sin, just bad choices. Still others maintain that to talk about confession of sin is harmful to self-esteem. It's even led to some Christian churches removing confession and absolution from their service so they don't offend anyone. Not confessing our sins has eternal consequences. As the disciple John puts it, if we say we have no sin, we, dis we make God out to be a liar and the truth is not in us. Malachi gave the same warning. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? King Solomon was right when he said in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. Half-hearted confessions or denials of sin were rampant in Malachi's day, and so it is today. But when we deny sin and sinfulness, how is it possible to endure the day of our Lord's coming? By ourselves, we cannot. But God promised to send a messenger who would prepare people for the coming of the Savior by calling them to repentance. Meaning that preparation for the second coming of our Savior begins with repentance. The messenger calls us to confess our sin. This is the starting point, as it was with King David after his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and the cover-up of having her husband Uriah killed. It means recognizing our inability as sinful people to stand before the Holy God. And where there is confession, there is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the very reason God sent his messenger, so that we could endure his judgment. God had promised forgiveness to all who confess their sin. The disciple John said it this way, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is true to his word not only to his promise of a messenger, John the Baptist, but also to his promise to come himself. This was the point of it all. The Lord himself, Jesus, came to refine and purify us by his cross. We are more precious to God than gold or silver. As a pastor, I've been asked, how, how do I know I'm prepared to meet my Lord? A Christian dies suddenly in a car accident or a heart attack or an aneurysm, People ask, was he ready? Was he prepared to meet God face to face? What if he was telling a lie when the car crashed? Or what if he was thinking badly about a fellow worker at the moment of his death? The wonderful truth is this. We are indeed prepared as we receive through faith the forgiveness of sins won for us at the cross and offered to us freely through the tools God gives us, his word and sacraments. God is faithful. Christ will return. And even though we have so often turned away from God, he gives us this promise. Return to me, and I will return to you. We do not need to fear his return because Christ has atoned for all our sins. God assures us at the end of, of verse 6, you are not destroyed. Instead, we will live with him and serve him forever as people who have been purified like gold or silver. What he has begun in us, he will bring to completion. He has, he has uh, tied, uh, tied you to the death and resurrection of his son in baptism. All sin has been paid for, past, present, and future, even the one you and I may be committing at the time of death. God's grace is sufficient in all circumstances. God has redeemed us. Because of that, our relationship has changed. Like the parents and the daughter described at the beginning of this sermon, as people who have been prepared, we are called to put aside sin and every evil and to offer up our lives as living sacrifices to God and our neighbor. Then, God says in verse 4, that is, when our sacrifices are motivated by faith in what Christ has done for us, not in what we have done, then our offering will be pleasing to the Lord. The writer to the Hebrews describes it well. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good 
that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have prepared for our eternal future through your Son, Jesus Christ. You prepared for his coming by sending your prophets to teach us your will and the need for repentance. Open our eyes to see our sinfulness. Open our hearts and mouths to confess our sinfulness and our need for your forgiveness. Keep us focused on your Son until he returns in all of his glory to bring your eternal plan to completion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant each of you his peace. Amen. We're happy that you joined us for worship today. Reverend Bickness is the pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Milbank, South Dakota. Sunday morning worship is held at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. with Wednesday evening worship at 7 p.m. Thank you for joining us in worship today. If you would like more information on an LCMS church in your town, please contact the district office at 3501 Gateway Boulevard, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57106, or log on to www.lcms.org. If this program has been a blessing to you, please send your comments and contributions to Main Street Living, 1400 South Duluth, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57105. We appreciate your prayers and support of this ministry. Through your continued support, we can spread the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Main Street Living is a production of Main Street Living Incorporated in conjunction with the South Dakota District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. 
and is supported by member churches and viewers like you. Created and produced by many people interested in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ.